Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kristen Schaefer, and I'm the director of CHE, the Collaborative for Health and Environment. Thank you so much for joining us, and we invite you to put a note in the chat introducing yourself and where you're joining in from, if you'd like to. I'm going to get us started with just a few bits of housekeeping. If you're joining by phone, you can download the slides for today's presentations from the webinar page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Also, please note that the slides and resources section on that page includes links to resources that our speakers will be referring to today. Um, for those who are online, we'll put the link in that, uh, to that webinar page in the chat in just a moment. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentations, and we'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. Uh, we'll also do our best to monitor the chat, but your questions may get lost there, so please do use the Q&A function. If you'd like to activate closed captions, you can do that by clicking the button on the bottom of your screen. Also, this webinar is being recorded, and it's scheduled to last for an hour and 15 minutes. With that, I'm very excited to move us into today's discussion. We'll be highlighting some of the latest science on the health impacts of plastics across the life cycle of production, use, and disposal, and exploring opportunities for and barriers to progress under the Global Plastics Treaty that's currently being negotiated. We have some wonderful speakers lined up for you, including my colleague and friend, Charles Patton, who will frame up the discussion and moderate for us today. Charles directs the Biomonitoring Resource Center at Commonweal and has many years of experience in international policy arenas, including the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, where we had the opportunity to work together many years ago. Charles helped co-found the International Pollutants Elimination Network and was Northern co-chair of IPEN from 1998 to 2001. She's also on the Global PFAS Science Panel, co-chairs the EDC Strategies Partnership, and is a member of the CHE advisory team, among many other activities and affiliations. Charles has been tracking the plastics treaty process closely and attended the first International Negotiating Committee meeting, or INC, in November of last year. She'll also be in Paris for INC2 at the end of this month. Charles, it's my pleasure to hand it over to you to take things from here. A very brief history to, to kind of ground us in the upcoming conversations. Uh, basically in the 60s, 1960s and 1970s, there was increasing awareness of uh, chemical pollution throughout the world, partially because of studies that were biomonitoring individuals and, and animals and finding enormous amounts of uh, what we call the chemical body burden. Uh, and while we were all carrying uh, chemicals that we needed to be concerned about and the global problem of this needed a global solution. So uh, the result of all these concerns and, and discussion in a conference in Stockholm resulted in the creation of the United Nations Environmental Program. Now, uh, the environmental program, you could change the slides, Rachel. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, the began to convene a, a number of discussions that ended up in the creation of conventions having to do with chemicals uh, and all of these are, have formed the background to some extent for the, the plastics treaty. Among them were the Basel Con Convention, the Stockholm Convention, and the Rotterdam Convention that just really dealt with how do we identify chemicals? What are they used for? What are the health impacts? How are they distributed? How are they destroyed? How are they used? What can we do about it? And all these uh, discussions uh, uh, are providing a lot of information uh, about what works and what doesn't work in terms of uh, conventions that can inform the creation of a plastics treaty. Um, so uh, among uh, the discussions for creating these conventions are a lot of input from scientists and people on the ground. And uh, recently 700 scientists uh, issued a declaration uh, that talked about the incredible need for um, the creation of a uh, yes, a creation of a, a treaty, uh, and, and they basically saying that this chemical explosion and the plastic crisis is equal to the impacts of climate change, equal to the impacts of loss of biodiversity, equal to the impact of the uh, thinning of the ozone layer, 
and other kinds of things. And the impact is enormous. And this means we need to get on top of this as soon as possible. So uh, the, the governing body of UNEP is called UNEA and in March uh, 2022, uh, decided to, to issue a mandate uh, to, to begin the process of discussing the creation of a treaty uh, through the uh, usual mechanism, which is called the, the INC, Intergovernmental Negotiation Committees, they get together and just figure out the scope of the discussion, what can be done, how we're going to do it, where we're going to meet. The first INC happened in Uruguay um, in the late of 2022, and we'll hear more about that later. Uh, four more INCs are planned, and we hope that by the end of uh, the INCs, uh, presumably 2024-25, we will have a treaty that will address these issues of this chemical and plastic, uh, very, very serious uh, contamination of the globe. So and I want to move right now to our very first speaker. Uh, very pleased to introduce Dr. Phil Landrigan. He's going to present highlights and recommendations from the recent report from the Mindaroo Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health. He's a professor of biology and founding director of the Global Public Health Program and Global Observatory on Planetary Health at Boston University, a study led by Dr. Lanagan in the 1990s at the National Academy of Sciences to find children's unique susceptibilities to pesticides and other toxic chemicals which catalyzed fundamental revamping of U.S. pesticide policy. Then from 2015 to 2017, he co-chaired the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, which reported, among other things, that pollution causes 9 million deaths annually. Uh, many other accomplishments and work that he has done is long recognized as a leader in environmental health and toxic chemicals. So uh, Dr. Landrigan, I'm going to move over to you now, and please uh, begin your slideshow. Joe, thank you very much. Um, let me bring up my slides and we'll get started here. Right, that should be displaying now, is it? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the work of the Mindaroo Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health. This was a um, large and distinguished group with uh, people from around the world, it was supported by the Mindaroo Foundation in Australia, by the Scientific Center of Monaco and our group at, at Boston College, uh, coordinated the effort. The report was published on May 21 and released that same day in Monaco. Uh, this is the cover of the report. There's the DOI down at the bottom for those of you who wish to, to access it. We purposely brought it out at this time on a very aggressive timeline because we wanted to put it out in time to influence the deliberations that Cheryl just mentioned uh, towards the, glo the Global Plastics Treaty and get it out in advance of the next meeting of the INC, which will take place at the end of this month in, in Paris. So plastic is the signature material of our age, and, and it's become a an age of disposable living, like this picture from Life magazine in 1955, where people use plastic, throw it away, and until rather recently have not given much thought to the consequences. So the purpose of our commission is to change that paradigm, to make the invisible visible, to, to quantify the damages, to count the costs that plastic has caused and is continuing to cause to the economy, to human health and to the global environment. And the particular tack we took on this was is to look at plastics damages across the entire life cycle, not just beach litter, not just microplastics, but the impacts that plastic has on human health at every stage of the life cycle, and including the impacts that it has in some of the world's poorest countries where plastic waste gets dumped. And the ultimate aim to protect human health, prevent disease, save lives, and underscore the fact that plastic is not just an environmental problem. So the, here are some statistics which will be painfully familiar to many of you. Plastic production has increased exponentially. Uh, 
8 trillion tons produced since 1950, almost all of it made from coal, oil, and gas, uh, very energy intensive. Uh, production is accelerating, so half of all plastic ever made has been produced since um, uh, 19, since 2002, and it's on track to at least double again by 2050. Uh, a huge increase in recent years in the production of single-use plastic, very, very low recycling rates, far below paper, glass, aluminum, and the consequence of endless increases in production plus low recycling has been the accumulation of 6 trillion tons in the global environment. Uh, plastics are complex. The backbone is a polymer, uh, an endless repeating chain of molecules like this. these chains going across the slide here. And then stuck into the matrix, into the polymeric matrix, are thousands of different chemicals uh, to give it color, to give it flexibility, to convey various properties. Uh, many of these added chemicals are toxic. They include carcinogens, neurotoxicants, endocrine disruptors. Uh, even more disturbing is that roughly half of them have never been tested for toxicity. And these chemicals don't stay in the plastic. They leach out, they uh, get into people, they get into the environment. So here is a summary of our analysis. We looked at plastic across its whole life cycle and our bottom line conclusion is that it causes disease, it causes disability, it causes premature death at every one of these stages. And again, emphasizing that it really is a health issue, it's much more than beach litter and microplastics. So we looked at the health impacts of plastic production, we looked at the occupational hazards, we looked to the, at, at the hazards to people who live in the so-called fence line communities, which are very often low-income minority communities adjacent to uh, fracking sites, oil wells, production facilities, pipelines. And here are the hazards that we enumerated to the plastic workers. Um, so you'll see that we have hazards that we identified for coal miners, for oil and gas workers, for workers that produce plastic, for workers that make synthetic textiles, for people working in transportation, and then over here at the right, on the opposite side, we have the hazards to the recycling and disposal workers. And you can see that it's, it's an enormous array of different hazards, everything from physical injury, burns, um, uh, to cancer, to heart disease, to chronic lung disease, to lymphoma, leukemia. Then turning to the hazards to the fence line communities, uh, people who live near cracking and polymerization plants have elevated rates of leukemia, lymphoma, and asthma, uh, premature birth, low birth weight, childhood leukemia, people living near fossil fuel transport sites, think of East Palestine, Ohio, are at risk of fires, explosions, air pollution, and people living near recycling sites are exposed to dioxins and heavy metals and other materials that are released into the atmosphere when, when plastic is burned. People who use plastic, which includes the most vulnerable among us, are at risk of multiple hazards, which we've enumerated here. You can see that they span the entire human lifespan from infancy through to old age, miscarriage, low birth weight, premature birth in infancy, a whole series of effects in childhood, including IQ loss, decreased birth weight, uh, altered uh, anagenital distance, which means uh, alteration in sexual development, a whole series of adult hazards and reproductive hazards. As a pediatrician, I want to take a moment to speak about the particular hazards to infants and children. And the, the, the point here is that Infants in, in the womb and young children are much more vulnerable to the chemicals in plastic than, than we adults. Even very small doses that would bounce off of us can cause lasting damage to a child, birth defects, brain damage, cancer, uh, and the consequences can last lifelong with autism, attention deficit disorder, reduced intelligence. Long experience, starting with lead, pesticides, air pollution, has taught us that there simply are no safe exposure thresholds for exposures in early life. Even the smallest doses can cause terrible damage. And the only way to 
prevent the damage from occurring is to keep the exposure from occurring in the first place. Our colleague, Professor Maureen Cropper from the University of Maryland did some elegant economic analyses uh, as part of the Mindoro Monaco Commission. And the reason for doing these economic analyses is not to put a price tag on human suffering. I, as a physician, that, that whole notion really sticks in my throat. But we thought it was important that in presenting this problem to policymakers, we had to make them understand that there are two sides to the equation. It's easy for them to talk about how much it's going to cost to reduce plastic pollution and ignore the fact that allowing pollution to continue costs a lot of money. And so the, we figured we'll lay out the costs of unending increases in plastic production. So what Maureen did here was that she used the global burden of disease data to estimate the costs of plastic production globally, and she found that globally, it's almost $600 billion per year. It's a combination of accidents, particulates, benzene, formaldehyde, and, and the health costs related to the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, totaling 600 billion. And then in a second analysis, she looked at the United States alone for the costs of the diseases caused by the chemicals added to plastics, these costs total up close to a trillion dollars per year in the United States. And the reason she did the analysis only for the USA is that we're the only country that has good data on population exposure to phthalates, to brominated flame retardants, to bisphenol A. And the diseases that these uh, exposures cause, uh, DEHP, diethylhexyl phthalate, causes um, uh, IQ loss in children, as well as reproductive problem. PBDE also causes IQ loss, and bisphenol A causes premature death from coronary artery disease and stroke. And tallying up those costs, it's um, almost a trillion dollars a year. Maureen is quick to point out that these numbers, large as they are, are an underestimate of the full reality because uh, we're only looking at a few chemicals, we're only looking at one uh, at one country. Our colleague, Margaret Spring and Adetun Mustafa, who's on the call with us today, did the analysis of the social and environmental justice consequences of plastic pollution. And I won't try to take you through every line of this complex slide, but the, the message here is that plastic is associated with social justice, social injustice, environmental injustice at every stage of its production, use, and disposal. Uh, just think, for example, of the disproportionate siting of fracking wells, of oil wells, of plastic production facilities, of pipelines, of recycling centers. The disproportionate siting of all those facilities in poor, low-income, marginalized minority, and in many cases, indigenous communities. You don't, you don't see plastic recycling uh, going into the wealthy suburbs around any city. It goes into the sacrifice zones on the outskirts of the city where the poor people of color live. Here are a few pictures of social injustice associated with plastic. The picture on the left is from East Palestine, Ohio, and the two on the right were provided by Atatun, showing the accumulation of plastic waste in various uh, states in Nigeria. So putting all this together, our group, our commission came to the conclusion that the time has come when we, we must act. We acknowledge that there's still a great deal we don't know about plastic and its hazards. We know that more research is needed. That's what we do. That's what we spend our lives doing. But we certainly feel that we know enough right now, very clearly, that plastic is harming human health, it's harming the environment, and that these harms are going to get worse unless we intervene urgently to bend the curve. The chemical industry is always willing to use incomplete knowledge as an excuse for failing to take action. We, we think that that, that that approach is simply not tolerable. We have to act on the knowledge that we have today. We have to control plastic pollution. And the way we think to do this is to strongly support the UN effort that Cheryl mentioned at the beginning here 
to enact a strong legally binding global plastics treaty uh, pursuant to the resolution that was adopted last year by UNEA. We have several recommendations that we, we actually had a webinar this morning with some of the treaty negotiators. Uh, Vito was also on there and out of tune. Uh, urging them to incorporate certain considerations into the treaty. Uh, most of all, we want them to put front of mind, top of mind, the fact that plastic causes damage to human health and that the treaty cannot just be an environmental treaty. It also has to be a treaty that seeks to protect human health. And we think the best way to achieve that goal and to reduce plastic pollution is to impose a global cap on plastic production. Think, for example, of the Paris Climate Agreement with the cap on greenhouse gases, or the Montreal uh, Convention, Montreal Protocol with the cap on uh, chlorofluorocarbons. The, the, the basic notion is that we cannot simply allow plastic production to increase at three, four, or five percent per year until it doubles again by 50, 50, by 2050. We need to, we need to we we need to put a number out there. We need to put a cap and the countries of the world have to agree to it. Then once we've got a cap, we can figure out underneath that cap, what gets saved, what gets, what gets reduced, but there has, to be, there has to be a cap. We had very specific recommendations, ban or at least severe restriction on unnecessary single use plastic. The treaty has to include the chemicals that go into plastic. That one of the uh, uh, strategies that the chemical industry is using is to say, oh, let's regulate the polymers but not regulate the chemicals. That that would be nonsense. It would be it would basically uh, uh, cause the treaty to be to be stillborn at the time of its of its delivery. It needs to include extended producer responsibility, like California has recently done. Uh, there needs to be a deliberate conversation with the. Secretary of the Stockholm Convention between the, the Plastics Convention and the Stockholm Convention to consider listing some plastic polymers and chemicals as persistent pollutants. The treaty needs to look very carefully at the disproportionate impacts that I've just mentioned on vulnerable and at-risk populations. It needs to do something about the massive transnational export of plastic waste. And the way to do that, we thought, is through interface with the Basel and the London Conventions Actually, a lot of the rules are on the books. The issue is enforcement. And we believe that the implementation of the treaty, well, its development now and its implementation beginning two years since, will require the establishment of a permanent scientific advisory body. The good news is that we really know how to fix this crisis. It, 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 it is not a mystery. And the reason I say that is I, I am encouraged by the success we've had in controlling chlorofluorocarbon emissions, the 70% reduction we've achieved in the United States in reducing air pollution since um, passage of the Clean Air Act in 1970. We've got lead out of gasoline and every uh, automotive gasoline in every country around the world. And these experiences provide a roadmap. All of these strategies are based on science. The science was translated into laws, into policies, regulation, enforcement, monitoring, uh, incentives are the package. Uh, and the impediments today, they're no longer scientific or technical. We, we really know how to do it. The question is, do we want to do it? Are we willing to overcome the legal, the economic, and the political barriers? And I would argue that it is our generation's moral duty, it's our ethical duty, to overcome these impediments, to act courageously, to protect our children's health and preserve this planet, which is our common home. So thank you very much. And I will now stop sharing. Thank you for that excellent presentation. And uh, look forward to the questions and answer uh, session following our other presenters, because I think these are some conversations that are just waiting to happen. But we're going to go now to uh, uh, Ito Busante uh, to talk more about how the negotiations are proceeding and what some of the issues are that are involved. Dr. Busante is an EU and international law specialist with expertise in chemicals, pesticides, and plastics. 
Prior to joining the uh, to IPEN, International Pollutants Elimination Network, he led the chemicals project for Clad Earth, which is an EU-based uh, NGO, very effective one, and the plastics program for the environmental defense in Canada. In his role as a technical and policy advisor for IPEN, he works on a wide range of issues related to chemical safety. This includes a strategic approach to international chemicals management, uh, SICOM, which is an ongoing convention uh, in, in process, as well as the Stockholm, Basel, and Rotterdam conventions. So Vito, uh, please uh, go ahead and share your slides now. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. I will share my slides right now. <clears throat> I'm hoping you can see the right ones. And uh, thank you very much for, for having me uh, uh, after <clears throat> also such a great uh, presentation from Dr. Landrigan and the incredible work by the uh, Monaco Commission. So I'm uh, here representing uh, IPEN, the International Pollutants Elimination Network, a uh, network of uh, 600, over 600 organization in 127 countries working uh, with uh, the aspiration for a toxic free future. Um, so after we heard like all the scientific evidence <clears throat> around uh, that makes the case for, um, uh, for chemicals and for health being covered in the upcoming negotiation on the plastic treaty, I'm going to try to cover a bit uh, uh, the discussions uh, uh, around the treaty, around chemicals, and how they have uh, developed. Um, so looking, I will be looking a bit at uh, how we got to these uh, negotiations and how chemicals and health got into the frame of the negotiations so far. Um, but then uh, trying to answer the question from uh, for this uh, webinar, will the will chemicals be regulated under the treaty? I will try to look at some of the barriers. What is the status of uh, chemicals regulation internationally and uh, make some suggestions <clears throat> on how we can uh, um, prioritize some uh, criteria and some groups of chemicals to be uh, regulated. And what are those barriers? Um, so first of all, uh, so these negotiations uh, are mandated from a resolution that was adopted uh, just about over a year ago in uh, Nairobi by the United Nations Environment Assembly, which is sort of parliament for countries that discuss environmental issues internationally at the UN. Um, and uh, um, so that was the first step, let's say. And uh, important to mention, as we're talking about health and chemicals, that uh, these uh, the idea of health protections and, and inclusion of chemicals is something of an evolving matter. Um, the framing of the discussion around the, plas the plastic treaty or the need to um, address the plastics crisis came from initial framing of uh, uh, trying to stop plastic as a marine litter. We may have heard of the um, that sort of a, a report that talks about the possibility of having more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050 if we don't stop producing or uh, polluting oceans with with plastics but clearly uh it the the issue with plastics does impact our health as as we heard uh quite considerably and uh, but in the initial mandate and and this is important for a negotiation health is only mentioned in a paragraph in the, in the preamble and chem chemicals are not mentioned however the fact that the treaty calls for a life cycle approach and for a circular economy approach and covers also microplastic, meaning it's not only about an issue about litter means that inevitably health and chemicals have been have to be uh, covered. And this is what IPEN has been uh, pushing so far in our role as civil society representatives in uh, the negotiation. 
and uh, we have been calling basically for uh, a, a better understanding of what plastics are, uh, meaning that plastics should be understood for what they are, a mixture of uh, chemicals, uh, some in the form of polymers, many in the forms of additives that leach out of the plastics, and mostly derived from oil and gas. This doesn't mean that uh, bioplastics are uh, free from uh, any blame. Also, bioplastics uh, can be uh, toxic, can include toxic chemicals. But, uh, but our second message is that the health impacts of plastics should be addressed. Uh, typically, the marine litter is the most visible impact of plastic pollution, and it does create does have a lot of harms in many ways, both to the fauna and uh, to also to economic activities, especially in places where they cannot deal with all the plastics that wash on the shores. But finally, as uh, circular economy is uh, one central approach that is being discussed for uh, for regulating plastic, uh, plastics and its chemicals, the idea of having toxic chemicals in plastics and circulate them in the economy over and over is something that is um, certainly not desirable and makes it a priority <clears throat> to eliminate these toxic chemicals from plastics. So where we are, where are we now in the negotiation? As I said, there was like that first meeting in the uh, uh, in Nairobi in March. Uh, and then there was a second meeting just for rules of procedure that happened in the car in May um, 2022. But the first INC, which stands for International Negotiating Committee, happened in, uh, <clears throat> in Uruguay between uh, the end of November and the beginning of December. And uh, so what happened there, surprisingly, considering, not surprisingly, but uh, as we've been working on uh, to, to make that shift, is that in the narrative around plastics, there has been uh, a shift. Um, many, many countries have expressed how important it is to um, protect health under the treaty. And uh, uh, many countries have also uh, talked about chemicals. And so if I were to uh, summarize very uh, in, in, in as a high, what is the highlight of uh, the first negotiating committee, I would I would say uh, that this is the most important one that health and chemicals were ma were mentioned by over 60 countries in their statements. And in their statements, they're, they're calling for uh, measures to uh, protect people's uh, health and to regulate chemicals, both restricting the chemicals in the plastics and, um, and also increasing transparency. On the right here, I'm uh, also including some materials that you can find on the IPEN uh, website is our uh, plastic treaty platform where we uh, formulate about 17 uh, ideas that we would want to see covered in the treaty to eliminate toxic chemicals and toxic impact throughout the, the plastic life cycle. So to summarize, as Reuters put it uh, on uh, uh, in, in the reporting on the last day of the negotiations of, for the first committee uh, in Uruguay, is that Plastics are not anymore being seen as marine litter, but plastics are seen as a material made of chemical. And this is a quite big change because we're going from talking about single use plastics to talking about plastic as a material as plastics are ubiquitous. And they have many, many uses that sometimes we don't even consider that have a lot of impacts on, uh, on society, but also are polluting our environment and our bodies. Um, later this month, we will have the second negotiating committee. And as we advanced in the, um, in the uh, negotiations, uh, things start to get a bit more detailed. 
um, and uh, uh, continuing to trying to answer the question about whether chemicals will be regulated under the treaty, we see definitely a momentum for uh, controls and regulation of chemicals uh, in plastics. Uh, the reports, scientific reports, keep on uh, uh, coming out. And uh, as the, the, the one from the, the Monaco Commission that was just presented, but also UNEP today, uh, the United Nations Environment Program presented uh, an upcoming report on chemicals and plastics, which also makes some interesting recommendations. Um, and, uh, but, but especially in view of uh, this uh, uh, negotiating committee, there will be, um, there was, the possibility for country to submit their proposal for what they want to see in the treaty. And what we have seen there is quite a strong push towards chemicals being regulated. Um, and that has been reflected in a, a paper that presents the elements for options of the treaty. It's a bit jargony, but it, it basically will be the basic document that will be discussed uh, um, at uh, in Paris uh, later this month, and then uh, it's a sort of like a selection process to see like where countries can find agreements in uh, uh, regulating uh, uh, certain aspects of plastics. Um, a very also interesting report on the governance of plastics uh, and associated chemicals uh, was put out by the Secretariat of the Convention, the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions, uh, and as I said, the ones, uh, the one from UNEP. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Like this map was uh, was generated uh, uh, by analyzing the submissions from uh, from countries, and so kind of reflects the. Let's say the political status of chemicals under uh, under the treaty. It was done by uh, two NGOs like CL and EIA, and um, and as you can see, uh, there's quite a few countries that uh, uh, call specifically for mandatory restrictions of chemicals, like uh, mainly uh, Africa uh, and uh, and Europe, and including Canada, Mexico, and some other countries. Uh, that are uh, that go under the umbrella of the what they call the high ambition coalition. Uh, for some, it's it's less clear, uh, and some specifically are uh, against it. But uh, this kind of coverage means that there is still a, a strong push in that uh, uh, in that direction, <clears throat> and uh, that is quite interesting. Um, another thing that I would like to highlight, in, and which is which we can also consider like how difficult it has been so far to regulate chemicals, is the the fact that uh, uh, and this uh, this slide comes from the report from the uh, secretariat uh, the secretariat of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions, uh, is that of the thirteen thousand chemicals that are known to be used in plastics. Um, only about a uh, hundred twenty, only one percent of these, so one hundred twenty-eight, are uh, regulated globally, either under the Stockholm Convention that regulates persistent organic pollutants, or the Montreal Protocol, or the Minamata Convention. So um, that's very little, considering like the large amount of known chemicals with potential concern. Uh, which are about over 3,000. But even more concerning is the fact, and that was uh, also mentioned by Dr. Landergan, the fact that we have so many chemicals used in plastics of which we have no idea what is their uh, potential harm. Uh, about 6,000 of them. And that, that is a concern that is going to be difficult also to address. Um, uh, reviewing the, the the paper prepared by the secretariat by the United Nations Environmental Program in view the, of this uh, of this meeting, which is going to be discussed, chemicals appear or are relevant to many sections that will be discussed. First of all, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, one important measure to control the health impacts of chemical of, of chemicals in plastics is is definitely going to be reducing the amount of uh, um, 
of the uh, plastics that are produced. Uh, the more we produce plastics, the more uh, exposure we will have, but also that reduction in production is needs to be also qualitative. Uh, qualitative meaning that there needs to be a phase out or a reduction of supply of chemicals uh, and especially ha hazardous chemicals. Same thing uh, when we talk about microplastics, especially unintentional uh, uh, mi microplastics, uh, priority should be given for uh, products that uh, um, break into mi microplastics uh, that, are, that contain toxic chemicals or that are a vector for toxic chemicals. And then also recycling. Uh, uh, as it was mentioned, recycling is also something that creates uh, potential hazards because often we don't know what chemicals are in the plastics and then they are used for uses that are different from the, the original ones and so they may end up in consumer products. As we have seen uh, at IPEN, we have done some testing of recycled plastics that we found uh, around the world uh, and finding like the most toxic chemicals uh, in them. Uh, and the same when it comes to design of plastics, and here it comes to the idea of the circular economy. Toxic chemicals need to be um, designed out of, uh, uh, of plastics. And same for the uh, specific uh, uh, language about health and, and emissions uh, when uh, uh, at the end of life of, uh, of plastics. So there's many ways in which chemicals are going to be relevant in these negotiations. But there are definitely barriers. Uh, as we as we have seen from that map, there are some countries that do have uh, uh, ambition, but there are countries that have uh, lower ambitions or no ambition. And the risk always in a negotiation is that there we take the the lowest common denominator. However, there is a strong uh, push for an ambitious treaty and to solve the plastic crisis. And so, that uh, optimistically we can can try to overcome that, but that is definitely going to be a barrier uh, when re trying to regulate uh, uh, um, chemicals in in the plastics. And the fact that the negotiations uh, speed is going to be quite ambitious, about two years they should end. Uh, and all, how to deal with all those chemicals with no toxicity data. Uh, and uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, for those that are familiar with chemical uh, regulation, one big barrier uh, with chemicals is also how uh, data is uh, being claimed as confidential and how difficult it is to share data uh, among companies, but also with regulators and, and among countries. Uh, others are around resources financial resources to implement a, such a treaty and the need for a scientific panel and a scientific panel without conflicts of interest. Uh, some of the criteria that we can uh, obviously uh, suggest, and I uh, go to conclude uh, very soon, uh, is that we should not have, uh, that we should address uh, obviously chemicals that we know that are used in plastic but the difficulties is sometimes that plastics uh in the in the process of making plastics there are some non-intentionally added substances that can be uh toxic as well and and technically uh complicated to deal with that uh but also exclude chemicals for which there's no available toxicity data the so-called no data no market principle um um, also considering like if we are serious about wanting to transition to a circular economy, uh, any chemical that creates barrier and contaminates uh, plastics, uh, uh, recycling, and and just the fact that there's so many chemicals makes it difficult to recycle these, these plastics. It's, it's surely a, a condition to, to, to have this uh, uh, um, shift. And finally, adverse effects. Obviously, as it was said by Dr. Landrigan, we have these chemicals should not be in materials that we come into contact and pollute the environment, it's like endocrine disruptors, like uh, substances that affect uh, the immune system, neurological system, and uh, substances that are very persistent, bioaccumulative, and mobile. Um, 
so some few cons uh, a few consideration also and because this is like an open discussion and and I'm happy to also uh, bring this discussion to the Q&A if uh, if uh, if relevant is the fact like what kind of approach to have should it be a hazard based approach getting rid of all the chemicals that are toxic or a more of a risk based approach uh, having a positive list like so only allowing chemicals that we know are safe or safer uh, and getting or, or having a negative list approach and how to deal with transparency, which is a big barrier when trying to regulate chemicals. Also, the issue of grouping is, is important. Uh, often chemicals are substituted uh, by other chemicals that are less studied, uh, but equally dangerous. Uh, so I think a modern treaty should avoid the mistakes of the past. Uh, and um, how do, do we generate toxicity data for all those chemicals that don't have it? Um, yeah, so that is, I will stop here as I ran out of time. And I thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Vito. You've given us a lot to, to think about. I think there's going to be some good questions generated from your presentation, which was excellent. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to move now to someone we've asked to join us because of enormous experience and wisdom in the issues of uh, epidemiology and toxic chemicals. Uh, I'd like to introduce, and it's my honor to do so, uh, Adatun Mustafa. She's a leading environmental epidemiologist in Africa, an adjunct associate professor at Leeds City University, at Badan, Nigeria, and adjunct research fellow at the Nigeria Institute of Medical Research in Lagos, Nigeria. Her research has been on air pollution, epidemiology, and respiratory health, social determinants of health, built environment, and climate change. She was inaugural chair of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, as that's short as ISEE, the African chapter, and is currently counselor for Africa and ISEC Global Council. Many other things and accomplishments, but I think we need to move now to uh, her comments, and she's uh, offered to help us answer questions uh, on our coming up Q&A session. So Adetone, uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce you and meet you and look forward to hearing what you have to say now. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Please confirm you can hear me. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So thanks to, I think Phil and Vito have done enough justice so this, my comments will only mean uh, to emphasize that plastic pollution, it is not just a waste management issue, it is a health issue. And the burden is being bare disproportionately by people who do not contribute mostly into its production and into its generation and mostly vulnerable people women and children, especially in low and medium income countries. So we all need to take a look, take a pause and ask ourselves, what are we doing? What should we all be doing to put an end into this? There has been a lot of recommendation on the extended production response, uh, producer responsibility. But in addition to that, we also need to ask ourselves, what are we contributing into the waste, into the generation of plastic waste? And to begin to look at what is the root cause of people actually using plastics? And why do we think people will go for plastics when there are not their alternatives? In our study, one of the things we realize is that the total economic cost of plastics and the social costs are not put out. So people tend to think that other alternatives are more expensive, but it is because the cost of plastics, the impact of plastic on health is borne by you and me and not necessarily the producer. So that needs to happen. The other bit is that there needs to be an intentional efforts by governments and by the society at large to address plastics pollution which is also linked to climate, to climate change. And this has to be to include 
providing relevant information to people and giving them rights to choose, to be part of the decision making. Let us let our people know that plastics is not safe. The fact that it is now ubiquitous and it is every has covered all parts of our lives does not mean it does not have a negative impact. And like uh, Professor Phil Ladrigan said, the good news is that we can solve this. So this does not require a trip to the moon to solve, but we can all make it a point of duty that we will work on it, we will cooperate across groups and between Global South and Global North, there needs to be cooperation also. And transportation of plastic waste and plastic products from Global South, uh, from Global North to Global South are things that we need to also address and put a stop to. And the burning of plastics in open burning, which is prevalent in most low and medium income country. I, I have a lot more to share, but I think some of this will come in the question. So please feel free to ask questions related to this. And also my lived experience, I live in a uh, low and medium income country in Nigeria, and I'll be able to share more. So back to you, Shali. Thank you very much. And thank you for your, sharing your wisdom with us and the incredible problem we are all facing in terms of recognizing plastics is dangerous. It's just, just a, it's an enormous problem. Uh, we have a few qu questions here and not a lot of time, but let me go through a few. Uh, Kristen, I, I see that you would like to respond to a question by Susan Wilburn was how can the excellent examples from Asia to prioritize reusable products and reuse and recycles materials be held up and emphasized for so, so South and North learning? Kristen, do you want to? Uh, Answer that? Take no, that actually, I was just flagging that as a question that the group might want to answer. Oh, I see. Okay. Anybody want to volunteer some comments on this question? Excellent examples of Asia. Do people, we agree that's something that's happening? Or should I go on to another question? Vito, I, you can hear. Sure. I mean, I uh, definitely there are movements in, in favor of like a uh, uh, Moving away from uh, single-use plastics, and uh, uh, but but at the same time, like uh, there there are some, let's say, economic factors that are actually pushing for more uh, of single-use plastics to be uh, to be uh, adopted by countries that then cannot uh, manage them. Like my main comment on uh, on reusable uh, and recycled plastic is that. Uh, it's definitely a good shift, but whatever reuse models are adopted, they should be. Uh, we should be aware that also reusable plastics contain toxic chemicals, and we should make sure that we should get rid of those toxic chemicals from the reused uh, products, and and also and especially uh, not recycled plastics in ways that we uh, where where we have toxic chemicals and we have no idea what kind of toxic chemicals are in those because they may end up in consumer products like uh, at ipen we have done testing on um utensils kitchen utensils black plastics and we found like uh, uh, uh very uh, hazardous chemicals even banned that end up being uh, uh, recycled and then getting in touch in, in, uh, with children in toys or or with uh, with consumers in other ways. So just be aware of that. All right, thank you for that, Vito. Uh, does anyone want to comment about how the former UN conventions uh, and of course the US has not signatory to these, how they have impacted in any way uh, chemical industry in the United States or chemical use, chemical production? What kind of impact have these conventions had on U.S. policies? I think a big one is the um, is the Montreal Protocol. Um, we've seen production of chlorofluorocarbons decrease around the world. Uh, we've seen the stratospheric ozone hole slowly repairing itself. It's an example of what can happen when the countries of the world get together and do the right thing. 
I think another good example, which I mentioned very briefly, but to elaborate on, is the removal of lead from gasoline. In the 1970s, countries around the world were putting hundreds of thousands of tons of lead into gasoline each year to enhance engine performance. That lead was coming out, causing air pollution, soil and dust pollution, getting into children. In the USA, the average blood lead level in kids back at that time was close to 20 micrograms per deciliter. When we took lead out of gas in this country between 1975 and 1980, we saw children's blood lead levels plunge by 95%. We saw the average intelligence of children rise by about five IQ points. That in turn produced an economic windfall for the country. Countries around the world have now followed that and the last country in the world to get lead out of automotive gasoline was Algeria, which did so last year. So it can be done and, and it can happen in countries at every income level. That's a very positive uh, examples to bring up to let us know, yes, this is all possible. We can do this. Uh, another question has to do with the fact that the oil and gas industry uh, is realizing that the combustion engine is being phased out and to, to keep up their sense of profits and their, their businesses, they are turning to uh, uh, and planning to increase plastics production. So what kind of compromises, what kind of discussions can happen to persuade the oil and gas energy industry to take more seriously what we're trying to do when we see, suggest that the lowering the consumption of plastics needs to occur and that they need to retool their operations to eliminate some of the most toxic chemicals that they are now using to create plastics. What kind of discussions are possible to happen? I mean, as, as Phil noticed, uh, the, the Montreal Protocol had a good conversation with industry leaders. It was very effective, very productive. What, uh, what about for this treaty? The oil and gas is one of the most powerful uh, lobbyist groups uh, in the world, I think, and, and done very good work in many ways. However, on this treaty, are they, are they cooperating? Well, I, I may sound cynical, but I, I think it's naive to think that the petrochemical industry is going to make change voluntarily. Um, it, it's important to remember that this is a, a vertically integrated industry, meaning that they control the entire supply chain. In many instances, the same, con the same companies that extract fossil carbon from the ground in the form of oil, gas, and coal are the same companies that make the plastic. Um, and the, as you intimated, Cheryl, they're, they're deliberately pivoting away from producing fossil fuels to producing petrochemicals and plastic. And it's a very, very profitable business and, and it's increasing at between three and 5% per year uh, around the world. And I don't see that they have any internal incentive to change that business model. It, it's, uh, I saw that Exxon posted quarterly profits this past three months of $9.6 billion, unimaginable amount of money. And um, I, I think that uh, the nations of the world are gonna have to get together. They're gonna have to pass it. It has teeth in it with national support from the governments of countries around the world and, and do something about this crisis the same way that they got together, the, way, the same way that the world's countries got together on chlorofluorocarbons and the way that they're slowly, haltingly getting together now on greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, Vito, is your sense that industry has a, a close connection with UNEP and is perhaps having more influence uh, with UNEP, then we would uh, support, just given that UNEP is supplied by government donations and governments are often listening hard to uh, the people that fund their members of parliament often. I'm sorry, this is an awkward question, but Vito, can you want to comment on this? I'll be diplomatic. Um... I, th I think the the oil and gas industry have being one of the biggest and more most influential one uh, has its ways. Um, the 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 issue being also that uh, we need to change the the system of incentives. Like a a a, com a company will not decide to put itself out of business uh, unless we make it difficult for them to 
to continue business as usual. So there, there are different uh, issues here. On, on the issues of the, definitely the, the, the transition to uh, a low carbon economy is also going to, uh, that is all mainly impacting the, the energy sector is going to create an incentive for creating more, more plastics and, and more materials. And we need to look at how to deal with that. One way, uh, like an initial way, and is looking at at production, uh, and uh, and one way to look at production is to uh, look at subsidies. Uh, there are countries. The, the I, I live in Canada, and uh, uh, the the Canadian government still is uh, has a, some positive uh, uh, views on the plastic treaty, but at the same time provides a lot of uh, 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 subsidies to the uh, to the sector. So it, it is a bit uh, uh, contradictory. And, and so we need to stop that, uh, that system uh, uh, of incentives. There is a, an issue of conflict of interest. Uh, we know how science is, uh, uh, it could be impacted on that. We, we have a, like a long history that goes back to tobacco control, but maybe we can even talk about lead and gasoline like initial decisions like of even putting lead and gasoline that were ill-informed by let's say bad science uh so we need to also be careful in these negotiations to uh, uh to have the support of the right scientists and i think uh unlike other uh processes that i've seen we we're on a good track uh, um, uh, i think that there was a brought up in this conversation the idea of of a panel of scientists that will continue to inform uh, the creation of a treaty and its implementation. Um, and UNIA had called for a, a panel to be put together, uh, a model on the IPCC, the one that the science panel on that deals with climate change. Do you think that that panel that has come into uh, existence is the uh, International uh, Chemical Pollution Panel is a, a, a sufficient model for a panel of scientists to continually inform the creation and implementation of this treaty, or does it need to be more expansive or more targeted? What's your impression so far? So I I would say that it's essential it's essential that there should be uh, a scientific panel to advise the secretariat who will administer the the new treaty. Um, this is a science rich environment. Uh, there's a great deal of complex data that needs to be taken into consideration. Vito has mentioned several times the, the need to be very mindful of uh, getting into unfortunate substitution where one toxic chemical is put in in place of another. And so there has to be a, I think it's essential that there should be a science panel that advises the, the, the implementation of the treaty both the writing and the implementation is both before, during, and after uh, the, the creation. That said, it's going to be the the comp the composition of this advisory panel is going to be very, very important. I think first of all, it has to be it has to be broad. It has to include not only scientists, but it has to include some indigenous voices. It has to include uh, various affected communities. Uh, Secondly, unless exquisite care is taken to protect this panel against conflict of interest, it could easily become corrupted and become a tool of the polluting industries. I, th I think a, a model for that, perhaps the best model out there at the present time is the model um, that has been put in place by the World Health Organization and by IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the cancer arm of WHO, uh, they they have an incredibly meticulous process to screen people for conflict of interest before people are allowed on any of their expert advisory panels. No tobacco, no alcohol, no toxic chemicals, no gun manufacture, and so on. And they really look deep, and they don't just take a person's um, uh, bland statement that they have no conflict of interest. They they look beneath that, and I think I think similar procedures need to be applied here. Fortunately, since UNEP, sorry, since WHO has already done the work, the work of 
developing these, these processes, they can be copied. They don't have to be invented de novo. Thank you, that's really good. Some really good ideas there. Uh, one of the question, do you, does anyone see uh, the essential use concept be integrated into this discussion of a learning use of, of, of plastics? Is that something that might be integrated uh, successfully into the treaty? Has that been discussed? I think, a, I think a good question is whether that's going to be an opt in or an opt out. Mm -hmm. Some uses of plastic are essential. I'm a medical doctor. I, I need plastic to do certain things intravenous, endoscopes, laryngotracheal tubes. But you know, the, the medical market is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total plastics market. And I, I think the 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 rules that define essential use have to be very carefully written. Otherwise, it becomes an enormous loophole that permits the continued manufacture of almost any type of plastic you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, oh, no, I, I just wanted to, to answer to that, like in, in the sense that uh, uh, I think the, the idea of reducing plastics could uh, uh, surely coexist with an idea of like uses where plastics uh, uh, is essential. I'm, I'm also sure that, uh, and I think some of our the of the people attending this webinar are uh, work uh, are familiar with the healthcare sector. There's a, there's also ways in the healthcare sector to detoxify those plastics, even if they're uh, they are uh, very useful, if uh, if not essential. But also, like reducing uh, uh, the amount of waste uh, that we generate is uh, is also um, a way forward. Uh, but obviously, when whenever we try to define something as being essential, it's 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 always difficult because you know it's it depends on uh, on our perspective, like what is essential and what is essential to whom. Uh, so, so uh, a final question is. Uh... Are you optimistic about the outcome of this treaty? Do you feel that we will be successful in moving forward many of the ideas you all have put forward? I'm, I'm always an optimist, but a, a, a cautious optimist. I, as, as Vito said, there has been great growth in the past year or two of recognition of the importance of the plastics crisis. I think the report about 18 months ago from the Stockholm Environment Institute saying that the uh, crisis of chemical and plastics has risen to the level of a climate crisis that it threatens to undermine the life support system, the, the support systems that sustain all life on earth was a, uh, a maybe a bit wonky, but very, very powerful statement with a, with a, with a big, with a powerful graphic. I, I think all the work that we're seeing Evolve the multiple reports that we've we've talked about today speak to the growing pressure to um, to reduce this hazard. You know, you know, and broadly speaking, getting back to the question of how do you get industry to do the right thing here? Um, that broadly speaking, there's three ways to proceed. One is to prohibit certain behaviors. The second is to incentivize other behaviors. And the third is to eliminate externalities like subsidies. Subsidies to the petrochemical industry in the USA are, nobody knows exactly how much it is because it comes from multiple pockets of government, but it's been estimated to be at least $35 billion per year. It's a massive amount of money. And a, a combination of those three strategies could do the job. It's really the approach that uh, people are taking in, in the climate world. You, you can either put a tax on carbon emissions you can incentivize green energy or a combination of the two, while again, removing subsidies. Thank you for that. Okay. Shelley, please, I just want to add a comment on the essential use of plastics. I think we all need to first of all come to the realization that we need to start from where it is easy that we all have control over and to stop single-use plastics. I think that is the first step. Let's start gradually. 
For instance, in most low and medium income countries, single use plastic constitutes a lot of the plastics that are going into the environment and that are impacting people. I give an instance. Most countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa don't have direct water, government provided water into homes or the water is contaminated. So they have to provide to dig well and for themselves or the water is not available. So people are constrained to buy water in plastic sachets to drink. Then when you look at the plastics that get into the environment that constitute health hazards, these are products of lack of water for people to drink, public provided water. So you cannot call that essential use of plastics. What is needed is for government to provide the water for the public. So we need to be very careful when people start labeling essential use because what is essential in one part of the world is really not essential. So, and this is why we need a, both a global and national efforts to actually tackle this. And sometimes it goes beyond plastics that are on the surface. But what is driving people towards plastics? I think we need to start addressing, especially to address the social and environmental injustice associated with it. That is one I just talked about provision of water. The other one is poverty. Why do people take waste, plastic waste, into their community? Because they are poor. So somebody offered to pay them and they take it and they work with it. In one in, in her reports, one of the there is a, a, a photo of, in, uh, from Asia of a woman and children um, working, segregating plastics and water view. It is only in low and medium income until you find children at such age exposed to occupational hazards. Of course, in other parts of the world, children play with plastics and water view. But occupational hazard, informal sector of waste pickers, it is a huge issue in global south. And these are things we need to look at that are driving social and environmental injustice. The other bit is about how do waste gets disposed? Open burning of plastic should be banned globally. This still seem one of the ways some people in low and medium income countries dispose waste. So this has to be stopped. And sometimes it takes global efforts, sometimes it's also national efforts. But these are things we all need to consider when we are talking about addressing and curbing plastic pollution. Back to you. Very important, very important. Thank you very much for your comments here. Just, just extremely important. So thank you very much. We have come to the end of our time today. There are some questions that we haven't been able to uh, ask and we'll look at those and perhaps be able to uh, get some answers for some, some that are outstanding, uh, but we need to close now this webinar. So I'm going to go back and uh, ask Kristen to uh, sign us all out and, and um, thank you all very much for your excellent presentations. Very, very important. And we hope to continue doing discussions on the, the next INC and this plastic treaty to answer uh, the, the needs of, of uh, what everybody needs to, to avoid uh, toxic chemicals and have the services they kind of need so they can avoid plastics. As I don't know about that, this is an incredibly important point. Krista, can I turn this now over to you, please? Yes, thank you so much, Charles. Um, and thank you to uh, Mr. Monsante, Dr. Landrigan, for your excellent presentations, and to you, Dr. Mustafa, for your insights and sharing. Uh, thanks also to all of today's participants for your thoughtful questions. As Charles mentioned, I know we didn't weren't able to get to all of them, um, but we may, if the presenters are willing, we might follow up and and post some additional thoughts and answers to your question on our website. Uh, we do plan to host follow up conversations as the treaty process moves forward. So if you're interested in this topic, please keep an eye out for details uh, in our newsletter and on our website. And I have just a few quick announcements as we wrap up. First, a video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and everyone who registered for today's session will receive an email with a link to the video. 
Uh, we also invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars. On Wednesday, May 17th, the EDC Strategies Partnership will host a discussion with Dr. William Goodson about his research documenting dramatic reductions in cellular markers of breast cancer risk when exposure to chemicals commonly found in personal care products, specifically parabens and phthalates, are reduced or eliminated. So you'll find more details on the CHE homepage at healthandenvironment.org, and we'll also drop a direct link into the chat now so you can see more details and register for that webinar. Then on Tuesday, May 23rd, CHE will host a conversation with Dr. David Carpenter, Dr. Tyrone Hayes, and Stacey Malkin exploring how to respond effectively to industry pressure on scientists. Again, you'll find more details at the CHE homepage and we'll also share the direct link in the chat now. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We hope you found this information useful and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks so much once again to all of our panelists, both for speaking with us today and for all your work on this important issue. And finally, many thanks to Charles for her excellent moderation and to Chase Senior Science and Policy Advisor, Rachel Massey, for her behind the scenes support. We look forward to seeing you all again soon.